Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name's Charlie Jeffrey, uh, Vice Principal of the University of Edinburgh. Uh, welcome uh, to uh, this uh, lecture this evening. Uh, we're very, very pleased to be hosting one of the UK Parliament's open lecture series, uh, which is designed to raise awareness of and strengthen the engagement of citizens with the UK Parliament. <coughs> and I see from the Parliament website that the open lectures are delivered by senior figures from within the Parliament. Uh, well, I think we hit the jackpot tonight. Uh, they don't get more senior than Mr Speaker, the Right Honourable John Burko uh, MP, uh, Speaker of the House of Commons since 2009 and an MP since 1997. Uh, John Burko has been a, an extraordinarily energetic speaker, uh, carrying out the role we see uh, on TV keeping order in a disorderly place uh, with great robustness, uh, but also emerging as perhaps the most reformist speaker of the modern era. Uh, let me highlight two areas. Uh, first, he's presided over reforms in the committees of the Commons and in the Chamber, uh, which hold the government to account much more firmly than the government used to be held to account, which I think is a, a very good thing. Uh, and second, working with colleagues in the House of Lords, he's opened up Parliament with a much stronger emphasis on outreach, including uh, lectures like this, but also in the development of parliamentary studies courses in universities across the UK, which are supported and co-taught by Parliament staff. Uh, indeed, we have one of those courses, and our parliamentary studies students in the Department of Politics and International Relations will tomorrow be co-taught by this member of Parliament staff, John Burko. So many thanks uh, for that. Uh, before we begin, let me apologise for the late change of lecture theatre. <coughs> uh, I, I could say we felt it in the end more appropriate on Halloween uh, to hold tonight's lecture in this lecture theatre, which is said to be one in which anatomy students once learnt their trade uh, using cadavers procured by Burke and Hare. Uh, uh, and where Burke himself was dissected after he had been hanged. Or I could say we had problems with the PA in the Playfair Library. But, uh, <laughs> and I'm glad, despite the change, that so many have made it here and, and can now uh, listen uh, to John Burko as he speaks to the theme, What Does modern democracy require of parliaments. John, you're very welcome. Johnny, thank you. Charlie, thank you very much indeed for the warmth and generosity of those opening remarks. I'm bound to say that having heard myself introduced, I can hardly wait to hear myself speak whether you'll feel the same way at the end of my remarks is a matter for legitimate speculation and conjecture. For my part, it's good to renew my acquaintance with Charlie, who is known to you because of his leadership role, essentially, within the university, but who is also a figure writ large within the Political Studies Association, which he has chaired to great effect, and with which I have been proud to have an involvement in recent years. And I think I said on seeing him this evening, that this was our third meeting over the last 18 months. And I think that brokering an ongoing dialogue between politicians and the academic world is itself a goal worth pursuing. I don't see why it should be a case of never the twain shall meet. Very far from it. Seeing as you refer to Halloween, Charlie, I perhaps also ought to note in passing that I did have to offer my apologies to my own wife, Sally, who is tonight hosting a Halloween party, in case there's some lurking journalist I hasten to add, at our own expense, in <laughs> Speaker's house for various school friends of our three children. And ideally, she would have wanted me to be present, and of course I would like to have been present, but there was some mix-up, I think, on somebody's part, but not mine, and certainly not this great university's. And I said, I am committed to being in Edinburgh that night, and I very much look forward to delivering my lecture. So I've sent my best wishes to her and to our children, who doubtless will have a joyous time. And they think that my experience, by comparison, 
is dull, though I don't view it in those terms. I told my nine-year-old, Oliver, that I would be delivering a lecture, and he asked what a lecture was, and I explained that it was a form of speech, to which he rather irreverently replied, in other words, Daddy, you will be banging on. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, it is something like that, but there you go. So I do want to begin by thanking you for the introduction and to emphasise to you that it's a huge personal pleasure for me to be here tonight, which I hope will be obvious to you. I have, as Charlie generously acknowledged in his opening remarks, sought throughout my time as Speaker to engage as widely as possible, and indeed, for me, that has meant specifically addressing as many university audiences as possible amongst other institutions. There are really two reasons for that engagement with universities. First, it is in part a reflection of the premium I attach to engaging with the student population, not only across the United Kingdom, but abroad as well. Witness that I've spoken at Harvard and at New Delhi University and the University of Auckland a matter of a few months ago. Secondly, it's because I have perhaps a rather unfashionable respect for the academic community. I would not be the person that I am, for better or for worse, with the opportunities that I have had without the fantastic education which I received at the University of Essex. I truly believe that higher education is the ultimate liberating experience which a young person can secure, but that experience relies crucially upon the devotion, the skill and the wisdom of those whose vocation it is to stimulate students. My late father always used to say, enjoy your school days, son, they're the happiest days of your life. And I must emphasize to you that I am hiding nothing from you. I am not the owner of some dark secret as to a miserable school experience. School days were so-so, but they certainly weren't for me especially happy days, whereas the three years that I spent at the University of Essex were enormous fun, endlessly stimulating, and something to which I look back now with great fondness and also a much greater appreciation than I do specifically in relation to my time as a school student. This university has a global reputation, I think second to none, forged over centuries, inspired by the Enlightenment, and sustained to the present day. So it is a privilege both to be here in order to state those facts and to subject myself to what I am sure will be friendly but forensic questioning at the conclusion of this lecture. That, after all, is the nature of intellectual exchange, which I very much welcome. I must admit, however, that in deciding how to frame my remarks here, I have considered matters with unusual trepidation. Scotland is as must be obvious to anyone who is reasonably sentient in the throes of a huge debate about its constitutional and national future, one which will stretch until September next year at the very least and will doubtless continue in some form thereafter. I am therefore deeply aware that given my non-partisan status as Speaker of the United Kingdom Parliament, I risk walking through quicksand simply by opening my mouth at all. Almost anything that I say, do not say, or am thought to say could be interpreted as an attempt to influence the debate here in one form or another. On the other hand, I would hate to lure you to this place and then be bland. I like to think that this would also break the habit of a lifetime. So my approach today will not be to seek to impose myself in what would in any case be a minor or modest fashion on what is your discussion and your debate about your future. I want to ask, if I may, a larger question about the underlying character of modern democracies and parliaments, which I think is consequential, whether the years ahead should consist of a Westminster Parliament and an Edinburgh Parliament existing within the current constitutional settlement, or instead one where they are separated from each other. For in truth, all the parliaments in established democracies are facing very considerable challenges. All those who care about and continue to root for strong parliaments within strong democracies need to respond to those challenges in whatever constitutional or national context 
they might find themselves. This is, in essence, an argument about ideas. And where better to make an argument about ideas than at the University of Edinburgh? The question I've set myself is, what does modern democracy require of parliaments? It is clearly impossible to set out an answer without an analysis of what, if anything, is actually modern about modern democracies. As I will note shortly, it could be asserted that modern democracies are rather less modern than their contemporaries believe them to be. Only when one has identified the fundamental characteristics of modern democracies is it possible to contend how parliaments should respond to these features and to assess whether parliaments are capable of so responding. What is so modern about modern democracies anyway? Most features of our democracy are, after all, strikingly familiar. We vote in much the same manner as we have voted for decades. We do so in person on a Thursday after an election campaign of predictable length and pretty predictable character with manifestos and party election broadcasts and according to rules which would not look that strange to a politically interested person who had the misfortune to have fallen into a coma three decades or so ago and now simply to have awoken. The political parties on offer to us have been the same for more than a quarter of a century, longer if the process which led to the rift in the Labour Party, the formation of the SDP in 1981, and its subsequent incorporation into the old Liberal Party is set to one side. Our process of forming administrations has not altered much over the past few decades either nor have the rituals with which we conduct our democracy, such as the state opening of Parliament, for example. We continue to have ministerial reshuffles for positions in departments, which, despite the occasional change of name and exchange of particular responsibilities, do not seem wildly different from those of the 1980s. The Speaker of the House of Commons now no longer wears a wig, breaches and other features of 17th century attire. But apart from that disturbing example of anarchy, much of what is witnessed in the Westminster Parliament would not look that novel to our sleeping political sophisticate. Bills still move through Parliament in a process that has not altered much in many decades. When legislation reaches the statute book, it is still announced in Norman French and signed by Her Majesty. Prime Minister's question time still resembles a form of blood sport. It could be argued that continuity rather than change is the hallmark of our democratic arrangements. If so, then what indeed is truly modern about our supposedly modern democracy? In fact, even in its own terms, the claim of complete continuity would be implausibly absolutist. Even the most orthodox observer of our political institutions would have to concede that there have been at least three strikingly original developments over the past 20 years of seismic importance. The first of these, and most obviously in the city where I speak today, is that of devolution. Where 20 years ago there was but one UK parliament, there is now a constellation of representative institutions – the Westminster Parliament, the Scottish Parliament, the Welsh Assembly, and the Northern Ireland Assembly. At a minimum, as a result, it should be stated that our modern democracy is one of plural legislatures, which surely must have an impact both on the Parliament which existed before and on the new Parliaments and Assemblies that have been created. The second element is that the electoral system employed in our democracy, which was less than 20 years ago, uniformly the single plurality or first-past-the-post method for all elections in the United Kingdom, save Northern Ireland's representation in the European Parliament, is now a very different creature. Scotland and Wales, and indeed, for that matter, the Greater London Assembly, 
all utilize slightly varied versions of the additional member system first associated with Germany, while all internal elections in Northern Ireland follow their European Parliament ballot in being conducted by the single transferable vote, a mechanism also employed in Scotland for local council elections. The European Parliament elections in May 2014 will be conducted on the basis of closed party lists. The contests for Mayor of London and the other relatively few elected mayors in England are fought using SV or the supplementary vote. In a comparatively short space of time, our democracy has moved from a monopoly electoral system to one of the most diverse sets of systems in the world. The final stark institutional change is that of formal peacetime coalition at Westminster. Coalitions were, of course, familiar in Scotland, where they occurred from 1999 to 2007, Wales, which has seen both a Labour Liberal Democrat administration and a Labour Plaid Cymru one, and Northern Ireland, where consociationalism is legally mandated. For the UK as a whole, they were, frankly, very unusual indeed. The depth of this originality is still not fully appreciated. Previous peacetime coalitions those seen between 1886 and 1940 on a not irregular basis were either informal or involved one whole political party, invariably the Conservatives, with either one or two factions or breakaway groups from another political party, be it Joseph Chamberlain's Liberal Unionists, Lloyd George's Liberals, or Ramsay MacDonald's splinter of the Labour Party. A formal political understanding based upon a published written agreement between two whole political parties in peacetime has never taken place before at the national level in British politics. It has been an extraordinary experience to serve as Speaker of the House of Commons at a time when such an arrangement, albeit more normal in every other part of the United Kingdom and in most of Europe, has come to pass, and to have been in a position to observe exactly how the British system has adapted to make coalition possible. It has certainly not been our traditional politics or our conventional democracy. It has added to the impression that what is modern about our modern democracy is not merely plural parliaments, as important as they undoubtedly are, but as the consequence of changing electoral systems in one instance and a highly novel 2010 election result in another, a rather more pluralist style of politics. These rather institutional explanations are not, however, in my view, enough fully to explain what is truly modern about our modern democracy. They are, after all, expositions which look at the rules and not the really significant players, namely the public who constitute the electorate. Devolution, electoral system change and coalition at the national level are all obviously very significant. They should be supplemented, nevertheless, by three other trends of at least equal weight. The first of these is that voter participation in politics now has to be earned and not assumed. Over the past 20 years, turnout rates in elections across and within the United Kingdom have been starkly lower than was once the case. For the UK Parliament as a whole, turnout which as late as 1992, at almost 78%, was comparable with the 1960s, slid to 72% in 1997, slumped to 59% in 2001, rose slightly to 61% in 2005, and then again to the still meagre tally of 65% in 2010. Elections to the Scottish Parliament have seen a similar pattern with a 59% participation rate in 1999, followed by a fall to just under 50% in 2003. Truly abysmal. 
and then just a shade over one in two in both 2007 and 2011. This decline in turnout appears to represent a detachment from democracy that is definitely modern in character and which is dismissed or ignored at our collective peril. And the fundamental point here is that it is not for the political class or for parliaments to wait until the public chooses to move towards them, but for us to take the measures required to convince the public that it is worth re-engagement. The second feature is that even among those who do participate quite regularly at elections, there are signs of detachment from traditional political moorings. Party membership, more or less across the spectrum, is in terminal decline. Membership of pressure, campaign or single issue organisations, by contrast, appears to be stable, even increasing. Voters are more likely to abandon their historic affiliations in by-elections, local elections and European Parliament elections, than they were previously. There appears to be a yearning for more direct involvement in the decision-making process than has been true historically, and a rejection of the long-standing argument that the political party is virtually the only legitimate vehicle for such participation to be undertaken. This is at least as dramatic a feature of our modern democracy as the declining rate of electoral turnover. Finally, more subtle perhaps, but surely extremely significant, there has been a massive change in the means by which politics and democracy are communicated to and between people. As late as the early 1990s, the principal fora were national and to some extent local newspapers and televised news broadcasts on traditional terrestrial channels. The ITN news, which followed Minder on a Monday night, 30-odd years, would regularly attract 17 million viewers. News at 10 today would struggle to reach 20% of that total. The BBC News has also taken a hammering. The decline in national newspaper circulation, which started with the red top end of that market, has spread relentlessly to the broadsheet or so-called quality end of it. The national circulation figures over the past five years have seen a decline of more than 40% for the Financial Times, The Guardian and The Independent, and almost that number for The Times and The Daily Telegraph. Our modern democracy is one in which there has been a flight to the internet and to some degree to rolling news channels. It is better represented by Facebook and Twitter than traditional newspapers and by the smartphone and the iPad than by conventional television. At the next Westminster Parliament election due in May 2015, political communications will be dominated by a series of platforms and theatres. The smartphone, the tablet, Facebook and Twitter, none of which existed when Tony Blair and Labour won their third term in office in May 2005. This is a revolutionary development. It is very hard not to conclude that it must be fundamental to the nature of our modern democracy, and hence to politics, that parliaments have to adapt and respond to that revolutionary development. If I could pull together the features that I have just identified, that participation has to be earned, that political alignments, even amongst the most electorally active, are looser and more fluid, and that the communication of news and ideas has undertaken a revolutionary change into a single thought, then it would be the following. Democratic politics in Britain has moved from the age of the tribe to the era of the network. This is not an absolute truth, and there are major exceptions. I suspect the force of this train has been more powerful among the young than the old, more obvious as a trend in urban communities than rural ones, and less absolute for the poorest than for the most affluent. 
The general supposition is, despite these important caveats, robust and valid. It is also astonishingly important. Our political parties are still essentially rooted in the assumption of tribal allegiance. Tribalism, of different forms as befits different tribes, is embedded in their genetic structure. Parliament at Westminster certainly has been shaped by a polity and a democracy which for 100 years and more has had tribalism at the core of its culture. Tribalism involved reassuring certainty. It had an anthropology which the civil service could anticipate and with which it could operate to its satisfaction. Networks, by contrast, are more organic and less mechanical. They involve different sets of people forging alliances on different sorts of issues and at different times. They are much more akin to the ethos of the startup or the fast expanding business than they are to the large corporation with a long history and a reliable market. Networks are demanding. They lack deference. They consider direct involvement to be a right and not a privilege. They are impatient. They are intelligent. They seek immediacy. Put bluntly, if parliaments do not recognize that the new hallmark of modern democracy is the network and no longer the tribe, they could fast render themselves inconsequential institutions. How then should parliaments respond to all this and to what extent is the Westminster Parliament, the legislature about which I know the most, responding to the modern aspects of our democracy? It seems to me that three principles are of exceptional significance. The first of these is the supreme importance of being topical and relevant. There are many matters which the House of Commons does and should debate and deliberate upon that are not necessarily top of the news agenda at any given time. Dealing with legislation is at the heart of what any parliament should do, and legislation is often highly specialised, technical, and even mundane to those who are not especially interested in or affected by it. Legislation does not, however, dominate the timetable of a parliament to such an extent that highly topical discussion about the sorts of issues that are dominating the headlines or are of particular concern to large sections of the public cannot be accommodated. To fail to do so is to do modern democracy a disservice. A modern parliament in a modern democracy has to be able to keep pace with events. If that requires some internal innovation to achieve that end, then that innovation has to be accepted and implemented. The second is the need for institutional flexibility in scrutiny. One size fits all might have worked in the age of the tribe, but it will not do so in the era of the network. We need to recognise that the oversight of ministers, departments, issues and events requires a diverse toolkit of oral and written questions, an array of different types of debates, and the select committee as well as the chamber. It is also not enough to assure interested electors that matters are in hand and being addressed. We need to move select committee hearings around the country. We should solicit evidence directly from the public as part of the process of acquiring intelligence. And we should escape the mentality that says that a subject has been dealt with once an answer has been published or heard or a report has been released. Modern democracy deals not simply in full stops, but in commas too. So should we. Thirdly, a modern parliament in a modern democracy has to reflect modern communications. It has to do this in a transformative manner, not just as a bolt-on to traditional arrangements. It is plainly a start to be present on Facebook and Twitter and to be accessible via smartphones and iPads, but that is the beginning of this process and not the end of it. 
There are countries, Estonia is probably the most advanced, which have become the trailblazers for e-democracy. We should be asking ourselves whether we are emulating them to the extent that we could and surely should aspire to do. So how is the Westminster Parliament responding to these challenges? I think that I can report some progress, very encouraging in certain regards, but to be honest, in some areas there is much still to do. I believe that we have become much more topical and responsive to the concerns of the public. I have sought to make my own contribution in this regard by the revival of what was becoming a rather obscure parliamentary instrument, namely the Urgent Question, capital U, capital Q. The Urgent Question, for those of you who are not House of Commons geeks, which I presume is the majority even of this cerebral and esteemed audience, is a device that allows any MP to petition me to demand the attendance of a minister in the chamber of the House at but a few hours' notice to answer a question about an issue, an event or a controversy that has arisen since the last time that the House was assembled. It is a form of instant question time, but one whereby absolutely any member of Parliament can assume centre stage. It forces ministers to address these matters in Parliament and not either through a media outlet of their choosing or, alternatively, not at all. It is an extremely modern tool despite being ancient in nature. In the 12 months before I was elected Speaker in June 2009, precisely two urgent questions had been awarded. Since I had the honour to assume the chair, I have allowed 149 urgent questions to be aired. I think that this is a change that is irreversible. The same, I hope, can be said of the House's Backbench Business Committee, a new body created just after the 2010 election and which has since elbowed its way to the centre stage of parliamentary life. BBCOM, as it is popularly known by my colleagues in the House, allows the House of Commons to take on issues, many of them uncomfortable, which in the past the whips of one or both parties would have kept behind closed doors because they were intractable, divisive, or both. A parliament which is asking more questions in a more unpredictable manner and in a more flexible fashion is one which is at least seeking to answer the challenge set down by modern democracy. The same might be said of our institutional flexibility. In the past, the chamber and the select committees of the House of Commons did not always operate in tandem. Some traditionalists, in the spirit of Enoch Powell, feared that committees would distract attention from and undermine the effectiveness of the chamber. A broader dilemma was that until 2010, not only the chairs of select committees, but the membership of those bodies was largely under the influence of the government and the shadow cabinet. Those who were meant to be investigating the executive were to a wholly unacceptable degree, hand-picked, perhaps even directed by it. All that has changed in this Parliament. Select committee chairs are now elected by secret ballot of the whole House of Commons with a clear political premium placed upon independence of spirit. Membership of select committees is decided by the whole party caucus and not by the chief whip and his or her associates. I intend to make no disobliging, still less pejorative remark about the whips. There is a role for the whips within a political system, and it is an important one. But it is a matter of record, which in the name of candour and transparency, I feel obliged to share with you, that I myself, before I became Speaker, always had a relationship with the Conservative whips that was characterised by trust and understanding. I didn't trust them, and they didn't understand me. <laughs> the change in mission that this procedural change 
has brought has been encapsulated in this Parliament by the Treasury Select Committee, which has taken a vital role in matters to do with the banking sector, and of course, the Select Committee on Culture, Media and Sport, which became the forum by which the whole saga of News International and telephone hacking was played out on a national and an international stage. There are more changes which I personally would like to see made to strengthen the individual backbench member of parliament and the select committee system further, but the reform which has been witnessed over the past three years should still be cheered heartily. Once again, parliament is at least attempting to move in the direction which the nature of modern democracy surely demands. I am also enthusiastic about the extent to which these newly democratized select committees and the Backbench Business Committee are seeking to maximise public participation in their dealings. The final area involves the whole question of how we best embrace digital democracy. I have to be candid and admit that I do not think any parliament within the UK or Western Europe has yet come to terms with the revolution in modern communications which I have identified and described. We have an excellent website, but do as many people consult it as we would consider desirable? Parliament is on Facebook, but can we really claim hand on heart to be a market leader here? There are individual MPs who have proved supremely effective as bloggers and on Twitter, but can we truly assert the same for Parliament as a collective institution? To ask these questions is not to entertain masochism. It is far more difficult for institutions than for individuals to adapt to this feature of modern democracy. Adapt though we must if we are to be all that we should be to the electorate. This is an area on which I am resolved to encourage the House to concentrate closely over the next few years. You have been very patient in allowing me to set out my thoughts on the nature of modern democracy, the particular challenges which they pose for parliaments, and to set out how, in my estimation, the Westminster Parliament has so far responded. This is an area where parliamentarians fall far short of a monopoly of wisdom and where I would invite an avalanche of ideas from all quarters. I hope questions tonight might lead us closer to some answers to these supremely significant political challenges. There can be few more important subjects to address than the character of our democracy. The age of the tribe will continue to be marginalised by the era of the network. Democracy, I contend, is changing, should be changing, and will change much further. It is almost 50 years since Bob Dylan released his epic, The Times They Are A-Changing. The pace of change is, if anything, quickening. We have to move with that change or we will risk being swept away by it. Thank you very much indeed for this opportunity and for listening to me this evening.